be seated. And as you're seated, turn in your copy of God's Word to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. If you don't have a Bible, I encourage you to, to step out real quick. Grab one. We have some in the foyer. Uh, we'll be looking at a number of passages today. I'd love for you to be able to follow along with your own eyes, your hands, and do that. We do have Bibles on your way in, which we encourage you to pick up and to work through uh, with. Uh, we've been uh, going through a sermon series on the fruit of the Spirit, nine qualities that God develops in his people through their union with Jesus Christ, nine qualities that he develops in us as we trust in him by faith, uh, think qualities that please God and a life that pleases God. And um, so we've been going through those nine qualities um, over the summer, and, and today we hit our ninth one of them. It's not the last one in our series, I have a couple more, but it's our ninth one when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit. And so you might know the nine, you can say them along with me, it comes out of Galatians chapter 5, so if you know them, you might know this, but uh, we know the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so today we hit the uh, fruit of self-control, and we are going to look at it through Galatians, or 1 Corinthians chapter 9, especially verses 24 through 27. So listen to the word of God. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. This is the word of our God. Would you pray together with me? Fathers, we come to your text uh, all of us here are probably aware of, of ways that we need to grow in the area of self-control. We pray, Father, that as we just take time to meditate and think on it, that you would expose those places, bring them to light, to search us. Father, you'd lead us in a way everlasting. But, Father, you would do so in the light of the gospel of grace. And so, Father, direct us as we think through self-control, but also as a fruit you're developing through Christ. We ask you for your help in these things. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, maybe you've had a dream or a vision, something, or maybe a job that you had to do, and you realized it was going to take a little bit more than the resources you currently had to invest in it. I, I remember it was going to stretch you. It was going to stretch your self-control. I remember one of those times. I mean, my self-control has been stretched in a lot of ways. One of the times was in freshman calculus. It was calculus three, which I took as a freshman. You know, I'd coasted kind of through high school, it was pretty easy, and then all of a sudden I get to college. And maybe you had some of these experiences where you just realize, as you hit finals, and you realize, man, my grade really depends on this one test, because I haven't done very well. I haven't buckled down, I haven't done the things I need to do. And um, uh, the need to develop new self-control. And to study down and buckle down and, and get the grade I needed to get. And maybe you've had things like that in your life where uh, something you wanted to do, something you wanted to be, um, some accomplishment that was there, and it stretched you. It stretched you in order to set aside time and to put focus into that thing that was before you. We have, we have a vision of who we want to be. We have things we want to do. And, and God does as well. He has, we're his workmanship, the Bible tells us. And he's given us bodies and life and he's given us time and he's given us gifts. He's given us abilities and that expectation in those is that we'd use those to reflect his glory. We use them in the way that he intends them to be used, not just in any way that we choose. And so that leads us again to think of self-control. Now as, you, as we work through the, the fruit of the Spirit, you'll recognize again that self-control is last. One of the one of the joys of studying God's word in this way and just expositing just through one or two verses is just to think through, is there an order to these nine qualities? And you know what? As I was working through all these nine fruit, as I just kept going through, I, I just kept thinking over and over, there's a reason that self-control is last. There's a reason that self-control is last. 
And that's because these nine qualities are not just all different from one another. They're all not all individual things, which, you know, we, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this. No, these are all things that intertwine with one another. And self-control is kind of one of those things that is the fruit in our life that brings all these to bear through self-discipline, through self-sacrifice, of saying no to things that we should say no to, of, of saying yes to the things that we need to say yes to. It's a fitting thing that it comes last because for any of the virtues of which God's word calls us to, self-control has to be a part of it. If we're gonna cultivate it, develop it, and see it grow inside of our lives. It's like the bow at the end of a, of a nice present. So we're gonna stay focused on what God has for us, the gifts, the callings that are before us, we need to think about that fruit of self-control. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at, we have a number of scriptures, so we're going to be jumping all around the Bible. So keep your fingers ready, um, to flip through that or on your screen or whatever it is you're going to do. But there are three main ones, and I just highlight that because these are good ones to memorize. These are good ones to think about. If you haven't, if you, if you haven't memorized these scriptures and you deal with some challenge to your own self-control, I mean, I'd encourage you, take one, take two, take all three of these main verses I'm going to focus on and use those as scripture memory to think through God's call to self-control in your life. All right, so the first thing we want to look at is out of Proverbs 25, 28. So if you want to turn there, and Proverbs 25, 28 stresses the importance of self-control. Proverbs 25, 28, it says this, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. There's a movie on Netflix uh, called Operation Mincemeat. Maybe some of you have seen it, or maybe you know the historical story with it. I didn't know it until I saw the, the movie itself. But it's a World War II story. It's the story of the, the British military um, wanting to make an invasion into Sicily and wanting to make a safe invasion of Sicily during World War II. And so in order to distract the Germans, they concocted a, a scheme. And the scheme was to get them focused on another part of, of Europe so they could safely land there. And so what they did is they, they found a dead body, a dead British body. They dressed him up in a soldier's uniform. And they uh, put a note on him, like a note to, to his girlfriend or something. And then they threw him in the water near German water, dur dur uh, close to some German ships. And so the German ships went and uh, discovered that body that was floating there, found the note, um, read that note, and they eventually, and they deduced, oh, there's going to be a invasion over in this other part of the country, somewhere over in Greece. And so it tricked them. It, 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 it worked. And so the uh, British were able to get in, and that was part of the, the, the weakness of the German military plan, was things like that. You know, the Bible makes this comparison in, in a, a way of that sort of story. It makes me think of it. Because it says, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. You know, just as uh, Germany was left... Um, in, in their attack plan, was left without the defenses they need through this trickery of a plan. So when we don't have self-control, we lack the, the, the defenses that we need in our life to protect us against various forms of sin and deception and the lies of the world and the lies of the devil. It's a fitting thing that they use deception in order to get past their defenses. It's the same way that the devil works with us. Lies and deception, that's what the world does to get past our defenses and to work around that self-control and to make a wreck of our lives. We know a city is only as good as the defenses around it. A nation is only secure as its protections. We've seen it recently in cyber attacks. There's new walls which are erected all around our nation and security is in cyber um, we have cyber attacks which take down um, gas pipelines, which take businesses hostage, even around our own nation. We see that there's protection that we need. Even Israel, once they came back from the Babylonian captivity, what was one of their top priorities? But to build a wall, because they know that without that wall, cities are made vulnerable. Well, like a city that needs good walls to keep out invading armies, we need good borders in our life. We need that self-control for the guarding of our own lives, right? Self-control is like a wall. It has a gate in it. 
because it knows what it needs to keep out, but it also knows what it needs to let in. Self-control is part of that, letting out, or keeping out the, the wrong things and letting in the things that we, that we need. Now, I mentioned earlier there are forces that are outside of us that are always wanting to influence us and to get in. But there are also influences which are within us. The Bible calls that our flesh. And those influences within us are contrary to God's will, contrary to God's purposes, and even desiring things that are wrong for us. James 1.14 speaks about it. It says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. So the scripture recognizes this, so that there are enemies, that those who are without, who want to you know, get over that wall and cause you to compromise, there's also an awareness, even within us, is something which is a remnant of sin, which is in rebellion against God. It wants to go a different way. So the Bible describes these, the sinful desires as that old pattern of life, something that doesn't have to control us anymore. Ephesians 4.22 says that we're to put off our old self, which belongs not to our present manner of life, but to our former way of life. It's corrupt through deceitful desires. These are things we taking off. In fact, the Bible describes it as a war. It's a battle that we're in. If you look at 1 Peter 2.11, it says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which what? Wage war against your soul. And so self-control is key to following Jesus, part of a spiritual battle that we're in. Not only from those things that are outside, but even within us, and the mortification, the putting death to sin in us. How else would we follow Christ to the degree that he calls us to in, in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, when he says to take up our cross and follow him? But if we're going to take up our cross and follow Christ, there's a death to self, there's a self-denial, and uh, there's a focus in a new direction. Now, self-control, it's, it's important inside of the Bible. In fact, the English word self-control, um, there's often two different Greek words, at least two Greek words, which are sometimes translated self-control. Um, that's how important it is. Uh, one of them, it, like we see in Galatians 5.23, um, is the fruit of the Spirit, is enkratia, literally describes an inner strength, an in-heartedness of the person, um, an, an ability to uh, control passions, the ability to control desires, this ability to do what's needed to be done in the heat of the moment. Uh, there's another word that often gets translated in the English word self-control, um, and that's uh, the word uh, sophron. It can also be translated in English into sound or sensible. You know, it's the power of discernment to make wise choices, uh, decisions that work better in the long run. And that's really the self-control we need for that long-range planning and then the discipline for ourselves to get us there. You know, it's fuel for the heart as we look towards the future. And so both these things come together, both, a, both a, the self-control of a plan of where we're headed, but then also the, the, that self-control of the moment by moment, the step by step in order to move us there. And so with, as those who've been called by God have a vision for his glory, we think about self-control and the glory of God in light of the big vision for our life. What's God calling us to? But also the self-control to move in that direction and not in all those other directions which our heart may be inclined to or somebody else may be pushing to us or the devil may be deceiving us too. The self-control of moving in the direction of Christ. All right, so that's the importance of it. I mean, it steers us, it directs us, it drives us through the obstacles of life. Um, but we want to see where it comes from, secondly. Now that we see its importance, we want to see where it comes from. And that's going to lead us to 2 Timothy 1 7, your second memorizing verse of the week. 2 Timothy 1 7. And it talks about the source of self control. Now, when we talk about self-control, we're talking about something a little bit different than willpower. I mean, the world loves to talk about willpower, and we're not just talking about willpower. Most of us, I mean, if I talk about self-control, most of us think, oh yeah, you're right, I do need more self-control in this area or in that area of my life. And many of us would think about that and recognize it. But when the Bible describes self-control, it's not just talking about some like, just pull yourself up and, and find that strength within yourself and to, and to will yourself through um, the things that are before you. Will yourself to success. And it's saying something different than that. 
And because this is something that comes from God. This is something that comes um, with spiritual power. This is something which is driven by love. This is something which comes from, as a personal direction of God himself. It's a, it's a gift of grace, I would say. We call it a fruit of the Spirit. It's not something, this spiritual power that we gain is not something we're going to find within us, but it comes from a life that is connected and grounded and rooted in God, and especially in Jesus Christ and what he's done. Now, if you look at 2 Timothy 1, 7, it says this, For God gives the Spirit not of fear, but of power and love, and lastly, self-control. Not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. Not of fear. Not of fear of being condemned by God. Not of fear of falling short of what God has uh, promised him. Not, Not of fear of missing out in this life. Because if you know Jesus Christ, your guilt is gone. If you know Jesus Christ, you know as you follow and walk with him, you won't miss out on anything in following him. You know that he has a perfect plan for you, and you walk in that. You don't live in fear. But you have this uh, this other spirit, the spirit of power, of love, and self-control. We talk about the work of the Holy Spirit. What the Holy Spirit does, he reminds us constantly of what Jesus Christ has done, that he died for you. And that in, in your adoption in Christ, you have an inheritance You have eternal life. You have his blessing. You have his love. And so why not control yourself and let your life be controlled by God himself? You see, our self-control comes from knowing the sovereignty, the control, the love of God and, and, and his work in us. It starts off by reminding us there's no fear. What does fear do? Fear causes a lot of the reasons why we lack self-control. Fear causes anger. You know, we're afraid something's going to happen. We're afraid of the consequences of the decision. So in order to avoid that, what do we do? We lash out just to shut it down and make sure that our fears aren't going to be realized. Fear causes us to be lazy. Some people are just lazy because they don't want to make decisions. They're afraid of the consequences of the decisions that are before them. They're afraid of failure. And so they don't do anything or or. or get out of bed or, or, or do the things that they need to do that are before them. They avoid trials. Fear can create all kinds of habits for us. When we get stressed or worried, what do we do? We eat wrongly. I'm sure you've heard of the term FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Anybody here ever deal with FOMO beside me? You know, when we see other people doing things um, or experiencing something, and maybe we have other commitments, Maybe we have other goals, or maybe we just weren't invited, you know, that we have this fear of missing out, an insecurity which is created in us. And and sometimes it might even cause us to do a course change, even go a different direction, in a direction that we're previously opposed to, just so we can have that same experience. The fear of missing out of something good will cause us to compromise, giving up even our own self-control. If you're missing out, it causes people to compromise sexually. They're afraid they uh, will not be able to be in a relationship unless they give in to that compromise. The person may want to feel good about themselves, may choose to act out sexually through porn or other sexual activities when that opportunity shows up. But the Holy Spirit gives power. We're no longer under uh, the fear of God's condemnation. We're no longer under the sense of fear that sin has to control us. We can live a different way. That's what we have in Christ, right? He has defeated your sin. So you walk in his victory. The Holy Spirit also gives us this this spirit of love, a bigger vision for our lives than just the fulfillment of our appetites. So through Jesus Christ, God gives um, a new heart for the loss, the suffering for the others around us and our neighbor. Self-control, then, is a result of being in fellowship with God. It's a result of being under his control. It's being under his word and of knowing the gospel of his love. And then that teaches us to do what's good and what's right. And that's why one of the ways that we grow in self-control is, just, is through prayer. It really is. I mean, it's in one sense that simple and in another sense that hard. I mean, you think about what prayer does. You know, something's happened and you're angry, and what do you want to do? You just want to say something, you want to do something, but even you just take just that time to pray, guess what you're not doing during that time? You're at least not acting out and lashing out in fear. You are practicing God-given 
uh, God fellowshiped self-control. I mean, that conversation with God uh, makes us more self-controlled, not just being controlled by your appetites, at least for that time. Maybe there's time you've been angry. And instead of something, saying something, you decided to pray, to pray for that person, to pray for that situation, to give thanks for all the things that God has given to you, and then you realize, you know what? I don't need to say that thing after all. You let it go, you let it pass, and you realize it wasn't that important. The anger went away. Or maybe you had the self-control in order to deal with it rightly, to deal with it well and directly in a much more constructive way. But God also gives self-control through prayer. I mean, it's part of the way he answers us through that power, love, and self-control. Uh, he gifts us with ability to answer rightly. He, he fills us with new energy. He forges a, just a bond even between us and others as we pray for them and we pray with them. Fasting is, is a way also of growing in self-control. Fasting and prayer, and, and you know, especially for those who have a habitual sin, which they just keep going back to over and over and over. And you know, so one thing I encourage people to do at times is just, just take some time to fast and to pray, because you know that if you cannot eat for a certain amount of time, and you know that you can learn to rely on God's grace, you can rely on his strength, is that you know if you don't eat for that period of time that you can abstain from sin from a seri- from a, for a similar period of time. I mean, fast, fasting and prayer is one of those things that, that, that God teaches us, trains us, disciplines us, that we can walk with him by faith. And he answers our prayers and strengthens us through them. So what matters if you want to grow in self-control is to know it pleases God and then to know that in Jesus Christ you have that power to do that. And then we put it in action. And that's what leads into our third passage this morning, which is back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, which I read at the beginning. Our third passage I encourage you to memorize, to know, to meditate on. Because it's a great picture of self-control. And it, uh, you remember, the Apostle Paul compares the Christian life with a competition or a race. And we're finishing is the thing that matters. When the race is finished, those who finish it get a prize for finishing. The only thing that would keep them from receiving a prize is the failure to finish the race. Now, along the way, there are many reasons to quit, many reasons to give up, many trials and temptations trying to pull you out of that. That's what the call to self-control is, is to finish that and to move across that line that we know the glory of God, we know the glory of forgiving grace and heaven, We know the joy of fellowship with him. And the choice to sin, to go off that track, the choice to to cheat, you know, it it doesn't succeed. And it doesn't lead to the joy and the life and the love that God has for us in the gospel of Christ. So uh, Jerry Bridges in his book, The The Fruitful Life, he goes through three different areas of our life that we need self-control. He talks about the body, and the, and the thought life, the body life, the thought life, and the emotional life. And if, you know, we've got to pay attention to all of them because we are all of them. You know, our bodies, our thoughts, our emotions, they're all connected together. When you think about them uh, together, you know, building up that wall, finishing that race, moving towards the prize. So first, let's talk about self-control with our body. First Corinthians 9, the Apostle Paul says that he disciplines his body to keep it under control. The Bible addresses that constantly. It shows that, you know, God has created our bodies, and they're good bodies, and God has created the things of this world. They're good things, but they're to be used in the manner, in the amount, in the way that God has designed them to be used. We can use them to excess. We can use those things wrongly. So if you look just back a couple uh, pages in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, you see that the Apostle Paul talk about, you know, all these good things that God has given to us, but he realizes that we can use them wrongly. First Corinthians six twelve, he says, all these things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. So there are things that we can let dominate our bodies if we don't practice self-control, especially our desire for food for rest, for sex, I mean, all good things, but things we're supposed to use according to God's design. 
The Bible identifies gluttony as a sin. It's the excessive use of food. Food is good. We can enjoy it, but we're not to use food in a way that we're poor stewards of our health or to use food in a way to avoid trust in God. The gospel of Christ, he just says, I will satisfy you. I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. Or we can look at rest. I love this passage on Proverbs chapter 24, if you want to turn there. Proverbs 24, especially in verse 30. As we talk about rest, you know, it's something we need to think about in light of self-control. The Bible addresses laziness as a sin. There's a call to put oneself to work and diligence in the things we do. If you look at Proverbs 24, 30, it says, I passed by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense, and behold, it was all overgrown with thorns, the ground was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. Remember, that wall is a picture of self-control. Then I saw and considered it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber, and want like an armed man. We need to rest. Actually, some of you, you, know, you might need the self-control in order to rest more and not be so fearful, but know the self-control, being able to rest in God. But we also need to know there are times to work and to recognize the things like entertainment, uh, binge-watching television shows, video games, scrolling social media, even sleeping. You know, those can be distractions for the calling that God has for us. The principle that we see in the scripture is to work six days and to keep the Sabbath day holy. Proverbs 24 is also a great parable about spiritual discipline. We're not to be lazy in our spiritual disciplines, but there's a, there's a focus we have in prayer. There's a focus we have in Bible study. There's a focus we have in the fellowship of the saints, coming together with a body of people. Because we recognize that without that diligence of keeping those walls up, keeping those vines out, keeping that focus which comes by, by spiritual disciplines is that we can find ourselves in a place where we never thought we'd be before, compromising ways we never thought we would before. And Jesus says, and he reminds us, I'm, I'm the good shepherd. You have everything you want. You have everything you need in me. First Thessalonians chapter 4 is another place where it talks about self-control. If you want to turn to First, Corinth, First Thessalonians 4, Especially here, it deals with our sexuality. You know, a place, a gift, it's a gift from God, but it's something that can be misused. And there, there's a warning that's here. It's a warning that should be taken seriously. It's a little long passage, but it's, it's worth looking at. First Thessalonians 4, starting in verse 3, it says, For this is the will of God. That's how it starts off. I love that. You know, aren't, many times we're wondering, what's the will of God? What's the will of God in my life? Well, it does, it does answer that. So if you want to know what God's will for your life is, it's in the next two words. Your sanctification. That means your change, your growth and grace. That's what really God wants for you. I mean, you have a lot of freedom, you know, outside of, uh, you know, outside of that to, to do the things that, that um, you know, use the gifts and abilities and talents that you have. But he really wants you to grow in Christ-likeness. He wants you to grow and be like his son. Anyway, so this is the will of God, your sanctification. He goes on. Explain some of that. That you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in the, this matter. See a warning here? Because the Lord is an avenger in all these things as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So you see the, the whole example that he uses inside this of a person who knows God is someone who, who controls his battle, bodily desires, the ones who don't know God and they're just let them run mock, just let them go um, in the direction they want. But there is a self-discipline which God gives his people as they know him. Hebrews 13, 4 reminds us we keep the marriage bed pure, that, that sexuality is, belongs inside of a marriage relationship. In a marriage relationship only. Jesus, again, reminding us how, what he's saved us from, what he's delivered us to, the new life, and the new life he's creating in us. 
Another place of self-control is in our words. We're, we're careful about what we say, words that build up, that don't tear down, words that are true and good and glorifying to God, words that speak the truth. So in all those things, rest, food, our bodies, you know, we worship God by self-control uh, in those areas. What about our thought life? 2 Corinthians 10.5 it says this, it says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised up against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So that, that, I, that, word, that expression, taking every thought captive, is an expression of self-control in your thought life. You know, are you a person who lets your, your thoughts run amok? That if you're angry with somebody, you just mull it over and you just let it go and you let it go free? Do you let that bitterness over somebody in your life just continue to grow and grow and grow? Do you let those profanities in your head continue to, to um, you know, mull them over? Do you keep thinking about a sin and considering it for yourself? Do you think evil thoughts about yourself or about your fears? Jesus says, will you believe what I've done for you? Will you see what I've done for you? Will you look to those things as well instead? Philippians 4.8 instructs us on what we ought to be thinking about when it says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about those things. And so are we letting, you know, through the two gates into our mind, right? We have two gates, right? It's our eyes and our ears. You know, those are the gates into our mind, into our thinking. You know, what are we letting through those gates? Part of self-control is staying away from those evil influences, whether it's pornography, inappropriate music, or movies, or books, or unbiblical advice on social media, is considering what am I letting in? But what do we do let in? Scripture, memorization of scripture, God's word, praying about it, listening to hymns, Christian music helps you thinking about God. Speaking good words to others is the way that we do it as well. All right, so we've done our body life, our thought life. What about our emotions? You know, God speaks about the control of our emotions. If you look at Proverbs 16, uh, 32, you know, it says something about anger there, which really could be described of any of our emotions, right? It says, whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Are you able, you know, there's a call for us to rule our spirit. And he says, you know, that all these, you know, economic or military or these other successes a person may have, you know, there's something that's even more difficult in ruling your own spirit, right? So whether that's anger, rage, bitterness, resentment, or even self-pity, you know, there is a call to keep our emotions under the control of the Holy Spirit. Even in times of depression and loneliness, we, we can't let our emotions run rampant. And if we find that our emotions are leading us places where we ought not to go, we need to get help for that, whether it's in getting counseling, talking to a friend, you know, adjusting our lifestyle to help to deal with those things. The big question for us, ultimately with all these things, whether it's our body, our thoughts, our emotions, is are we willing to give up the fleeting pleasure of sin to live a life that honors God? So part of obedience to God is keeping ourselves away from places of temptation. And that's why our friendships are important. The, the body of Christ is critical. A band of brothers, a band of sisters who, who, um, who are, are walking contrary to the world. Um, those who won't let the world disqualify them. You know, th those relationships are so important. And the need to pray. We see what Jesus has provided for us in his body to walk in self-control. But we need to get back to the reason for having self-control and discipline. You know, we saw in the first point that there's damaging decisions that we can make when we are negligent in self-control, but, but there's something more that we want. And we saw that in 1 Corinthians 9, and, and that something more is, is the gospel. It's God's love. It's joy. It's God's kingdom. Right? We want to love others with the love that God commands us to have. We discipline ourselves for the sake of others. You know, sometimes we discipline ourselves financially to live on less. You know, why? Why we might have the self-control to live on less so we open up opportunities for our, our, you know, better family relationships, better connections there. 
maybe giving to building God's kingdom. People have that self-control in terms of the use of the internet because they say, you know what, I don't want to fall into any sin in this area, so I put filters on it and I I have accountability so that I can work through that and so, you know, I I don't fall in that area. You know, it's encouraging to see how, you know, God's people are practicing self-control in order they can go after God and they go after God in love so they can go serve other people. They're a matter of joy. We want the joy that God has promised in the gospel and, and sin and evil, they, they take away the joy of knowing God and of seeing his provision. You know, it might seem to build a little bit of happiness, at least for a short period of time, but in the long run, it doesn't bring the joy that we want. So there's a greater love, a greater uh, joy which, which, which drives us forward towards the self-control. And that's why Jesus tells a parable in Matthew 13, 44, where he says, a man found a treasure and it was hidden in a field. And in his joy, what he did is he goes back and he buries that treasure and in his joy, he sells all that he has. I mean, he doesn't do it unwillingly. He doesn't do it uh, reluctantly or hesitantly. In his joy, he sells all that he has. And he goes back and he buys that field because he knows that there is a treasure in it. That's the gospel of grace, of your forgiveness, of your inheritance, of the life that has been purchased for you in Christ. There is love and there is joy and there is peace in what Jesus has done in his death on the cross. And if we want to talk about self-control, we think about him first. Think about the intentionality. Think about the self-control that he had in coming in this world, marching to Jerusalem in order to die on the cross for you. Think about the self-control that he had in bearing your sins upon the cross. And so as we come to a sermon on self-control and we think about it, you know, we can all think of ways that we've failed, that we've fallen short. You know, it's not just a time to beat ourselves up or to think, I gotta do better, I gotta do better, but it's a time where, you know, we look to Christ and we dwell in his love and what he's done for us and what he's secured for us in love and in joy. And as we delight ourselves in that, as we sing about it, as we, as we focus our hearts and our minds on it, self-control becomes something that's much more natural. It becomes natural in this way that, you know, if there's someone that you love or something you love doing, it's just natural to schedule your time to make time for that. Right? It, does, it doesn't feel like self-control to spend time with somebody you love. It doesn't feel like self-control to uh, spend time doing something you love. And as we know the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we delight ourselves in it, you know, and as we know the promises that are in there, self-control becomes more natural, more normal. It's something the Spirit builds and he grows in us. So you can see why this is a fruit of the Spirit. This is something that he develops and he cultivates in us. We have self-control because of Christ. He died for those times we didn't have self-control. He provides every spiritual blessing He's loved us, he offers us so much, and it's not even something we earn, it's something we receive, as we receive Christ as Lord and Savior. We say no to the world, so we can say yes to Christ. That's self-control. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you have given us a, a purpose to live for. Father, it is a purpose that is greater than the passions of our flesh. Father, you have set us free from them. Father, you set us free from the controlling passions of our life. What once controlled us, it doesn't control us anymore. But Father, your spirit controls us, and in there, there's life. Jesus has set us free from the control of the flesh. He's brought us into his family. In him, we have hope and a future. Father, with this in mind, give us self-control. Help us to say no when we need to. Help us to say yes when we need to. Father, there are those here who I know are struggling with matters of self-control and ongoing perpetual sin, and we pray, Father, that, let's say, that Christ would shine ever more brightly to them. We pray, Father, that he would be their encouragement and strength. Father, we pray for the body of Christ as they reach out to them to be encouraging in that. And Father, we're thankful for the gospel of grace, which leads us in this way. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stand together and sing